So with this being the first Sunday of the year, we find ourselves sort of at a crossroads with this intent on resolving problems we noticed from last year. Maybe you've taken inventory like we talked about last week about some of the things, some of the habits, some of the practices that you realized in your own life that maybe weren't as good as they should have been. But the reality of what we can take from that is that so often we use January as sort of like a reset. Oftentimes that's what a lot of people do, and we use that in the form of resolutions, right? We, we resolve to make this thing that we noticed in 23 to not be what we do in 24. And maybe already your resolution to go to the gym more, or to wake up early, or to read your Bible, or to uh, get to class on time, or to be a nicer person, you've already failed in. Congratulations, Welcome to the club. Because that is what resolutions do for us. These resolutions that we make are typically ways that we believe will better our relationships, our marriage, our physique, so on and so forth. And I I don't want to talk about resolutions today because chances are you've already missed, skipped, excused, whatever your resolution was that you intended on starting seven days ago. The reason for this is because we have created these habits that have formed us And trying to remove bad traits, characteristics, or whatever you want to call it, cannot find success overnight. And you're wondering, as you step on the scale yesterday or this morning, you're like, why am I going up and not down? And why am I not waking up early? Why did I have to uh, miss my alarm? Whatever the case may be, we recognize that we're not going to find success overnight in any of those things. And yet, why is it that even when it comes to following Jesus, we hope that those same principles don't apply? That if God is this all-powerful created uh, creator of all heaven and earth, that we have this in us the ability to believe that God can create overnight success in us. Now, it's not, it's, it's not denying that God couldn't do something like that, but God is not wanting some flash-in-the-pan sort of faith for you to hold on to for this year. He's wanting you to, as we talked about last week, Eugene Peterson uses this language, to find long obedience in the same direction. That God is concerned more with the long game than he is what is happening in your moment right here and now. So regardless of whatever your resolutions were, I think January is a better month not for resolutions but for reflection. Because how often and how many of us have already skipped out or missed on those resolutions and we're already like, well, the year is shot. I might as well just wait till 25 to do whatever it is I wanted to do this year. Those are the ways that we think and operate so often, and yet I think January could be a good time for reflection, and then come February, just a practical note, maybe you can find yourself looking at how to resolve those conflicts. But let's talk about habits for a moment, which is going to give us kind of a a 30,000 foot view of what we just read from Matthew 7. I want you to take that to heart this morning, that what we're going to look at through Matthew 7 is from 30,000 feet. Because we need to see the bigger picture of what Christ is trying to do in us. So let's talk about habits for a moment. We all have them, each and every one of us. Whether you bite your nails, or you have a nervous tick, or you have to flip the switch 33 times before you leave home, that's a whole other issue. But if that is what it is, like you have habits, you have these traits about you that make you who you are. And these habits are more formative in our life than we may think. These habits have created in us this unsatisfied feeling that if we do not give in to them, I won't feel myself. And these habits represented in this room are what are also forming you beyond just some of those silly habits I mentioned earlier. There's a deeper meaning to your habits that you may not be aware of until recently. And so you have to ask yourself just a simple question is this, what is the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning? I would say 98% of us in this room check our phones. Because for some reason we're under this belief that we missed an email that is, it might come through at 3 a.m. on some opportunity, on some collaborative effort with some influencer because my social media is blowing up, bro. 
And 3 a.m. is when everyone's posting because that's the, the, the world clock that everyone's on. I don't know. I'm making all of this up just for the sake of a point. But you're getting my point is that so often when we first wake up, we grab that thing off our nightstand, off our, our desk, or wherever it is close to us. Maybe, maybe your, your phone's even under your pillow while you sleep at night. Just because you need something, because you're too old to have a, a stuffed animal to sleep with. You need some sort of version of that for yourself. And so you tuck your phone in just in case you miss that important email or conversation at 3 in the morning. I doubt that that is what's happening, that 3 a.m. people are working and you're trying to wait for that important life decision, that phone call or whatever the case may be. Or, these, or, or maybe this, this normalizing of not talking to any other human until you've had coffee in your system. Maybe you're that person, and I, I, I'm a firm believer that this whole thing has gotten out of hand really bad in the fact that they're making mugs now that have different levels on the mug of when you think you're ready to start talking to someone. Have you seen those? You know what I'm talking about. You've seen them at Target because they have capitalized, thank you capitalism, for all the different versions of mugs that are out there that you can have before you talk to someone. And we joke about it, and it's funny because it is what it is, but on this more serious issue, I think it is something that is more serious than we realize. Or maybe it's the habit you have formed when you take the same road to work every single day. Have you noticed that? And now you're not even aware of it until now that we just mentioned it because you're like, I do take the same road to work every day. Or you go to your favorite coffee shop and you order the same thing every single time without even thinking about it. It's just robotics to you. It's just second nature. Or the habit of when you get home from work or school, the habit of you fill in the blank. You see, in this last decade or so, this conversation on the subject of habits, formation, discipline, whatever word you want to use for it, has really ramped up in the church. Many polls and surveys and trends are saying that religious activity is declining, but I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think it has just taken a different shape than we are used to seeing. I think people are becoming more aware of their habits, thanks to self-help books, TED Talks, and the like. And I think that our culture is more religious than we realize. It's just that church has been replaced with a yoga studio or CrossFit. Worship has been replaced with TBN or Super Soul Sunday with Oprah. I don't know if you ever remember that happening. Oprah was like everyone's pastor on television on Sunday mornings. Sermons are being replaced by podcasts and TED Talks. Pastors are being replaced by therapists. Community is being replaced by gym memberships or What's going on in your city Facebook page? You all know what I'm talking about. You know those pages that exist. What's going on in Riverside County? And it's just anyone posting whatever they want. The signal's out, or there's a dog over here, or whatever. Like, I need a recommendation for this and that, or whatever. Bible studies being replaced with theology in movies. I, can I just say something about that for a moment? I, I'm just not a fan of churches, and I, I may get flack for this. I don't know, but I, and I don't care. But... To find theology in movies is allowing culture to dictate what the Bible is speaking to you about rather than what the Bible is actually speaking to you about. Enough. That's my rant. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. That's it. Retreats are being replaced with these motivational seminars, and prayer is being replaced with what people are calling mindfulness. And I think many in our area, in the Inland Empire, we don't see anything wrong with how we live our life. We pay our taxes. We work hard, we live life to the fullest, we vote conservatively, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that so much of our identity rests on these principles and that you tell someone there's more to life than what's been described, they laugh, they scoff it off at the idea of a greater life than one in Southern California. The difficulty in following Jesus, and maybe you can attest to this with me, is that we are called to call others to this same rhythm of following Jesus. And the question is, have you done that? Are you actively, as you've been called to follow Jesus, you are also at the same time called to call others to this as well. People, however, just don't want to be told that they are doing life wrong or that they need to do more or that they need to switch their order of priorities in life. Because none of the things I mentioned earlier are inherently bad or evil. 
having a gym membership or going to CrossFit or posting on your what's going on on Facebook page. None of that is inherently bad or evil. But within the framework of Christianity, this does not suffice as your purpose or your identity. Even in our secular age, with a generation that no longer seems to believe in original sin, we tend to shift the blame on culture as the problem onto our neighbors, onto that person on Facebook who has an opinion about everything, onto that person when they walk in the room and you're just disgusted at them for some reason. You see, the issue, it seems, that most Americans believe is always external, which means it's always someone else's fault, and there's nothing wrong with that person. Well, it's the stock market. It's the current political office, it's entertainment, it's corporations, it's Democrats, it's Republicans. Newsflash, it's everyone. Because the problem is not external, and if we can really be honest with ourselves this morning, the problem with the world is us. And you're like, what? But I follow Jesus. I'm a Christian. I follow God. I do things well in this world. But you and me and every other human being on the face of the planet is the problem with the world. How can we say something so bold like that? Because the problem is not external, it is internal. Yes, we are created in the image of God, but something happened along the way. And if you've read your Bible enough, you know that you don't have to turn very far in the very beginning of your book because Genesis chapter three is right where we find ourselves recognizing that that's where everything went wrong. This image is warped, it's out of shape, So again, in our cultural moment, we can be upset as often as we say. We can be upset with the world, but we cannot be surprised by the world. It's operating on a different pattern, on a different rhythm, and each of us as believers, if you are a follower of Christ this morning, is called to live a different pattern of life. Imagine for yourself a beautiful painting, something like the Mona Lisa or a piece of art from Van Gogh's work and it's tagged with graffiti. The graffiti is going to seep into that original paint, and it will be impossible to remove from it. And in the same way, that is why our society and culture seems so hopeless. Because I think deep down they realize there is something wrong, but the reason for that wrongness is not something anyone wants to admit. I think we all sense that there's a gap between what we want to do And what we actually do, Paul said it best in the New Testament when he said, there are things that I want to do that I don't do, and then there are things that I don't want to do that I do do. You see, for followers of Jesus, it's about closing that gap. It's about laying down a firm foundation. And of course, the question is, how do I do that? Well, Matthew 7, we read here, it says that there is someone who hears the words of Jesus and then does something about it. That, right there, in and of itself, can explain to you how to build a firm foundation in life. You listen to Jesus, and you do it. Just do it. In the words of Nike, just do it. Just do something. When Jesus says something, take to heart what he's saying, and go and do it. And someone's like, wow, what a revolutionary idea for 2024. Listen to Jesus and do it. I have found that to be true in my own marriage and in my family. My wife says something, I just do it. I don't argue. I don't complain. I I have questions, but I'd rather just do it and then ask questions after. Like, so, uh, and it doesn't always happen that way. But here's what I believe from the goals that we've committed to as a church over the years that go with us into the future are this. We've said them often. You know them probably even better than I do, the first two goals that we have as a church are that we would, one, imitate Christ, and that we would then carry on his ministry. And the result of that, the byproduct of doing those two things, is what? We become like him in the process. We become like Jesus. We spend time with Jesus. We recognize that we will become more like Jesus. Have you noticed over time the people you hang out with the things that you listen to, the things that you read, the things that you scroll through, you end up finding yourself becoming more inclined to those things. It's because you've spent more time with that person. It's like the person or the the couple who's been married 60 plus years and they begin to look like each other 
It's because they've spent so much time together. It's because they grow old together. It's this idea that there are things that are happening around us that we're not even aware of. And so often, the reason we make that so clear cut and to the point is due to the fact that all of us, every single person in this room, is imitating someone. You are imitating someone. Whether it's the likes of uh, your spouse or your mom or your dad or your siblings or culture, someone at work, someone you listen to, you start talking like them, you start sounding like them, it's because you are all imitating someone or something. And we are all influenced by someone and we carry those beliefs with us and we become like that person that we follow. And so we unapologetically choose to follow Jesus because we are convinced that every other form of imitation falls short. You can go ahead and try other ways, but you will fail. And the way we accomplish this, the way that we accomplish imitating Christ and carrying on his ministry is through what we're going to call transformation. It's as simple as that. You've heard that word before. Maybe some Bible verses are coming to mind that you are um, allowing yourself to see as this form of transformation. And so as you undergo this transformation process, you have to realize that the transformation process is happening from outside yourself. You cannot make that process happen on your own. We believe that it is the Holy Spirit who helps you with that We believe that the person who commits to following Jesus, who gives their life to Jesus, who we can use other languages as ask Jesus into their hearts, will experience this level of transformation. And the message that we get to share with others is that unfortunately you got that process backwards, but we can help show you how to change that. This is where society has it backwards. Society thinks the problem problem is external, And the fix is internal. We think the problem is out there in the world and the solution to that problem is inside each of us. It sounds like a Disney movie, doesn't it? Everything with the world is the problem, but I have to find myself. I have to discover who I am so that the problems out in the world can be solved by me finding out who I am inside. Society has it backwards. Every single problem the world has ever seen or noticed has always come from within, and the only solution is finding it from without. And so followers of Jesus are those who take every part of their life, every part of their life, every part of your your life, did you hear that? Every part of your life, and see a need for it to be transformed. No part of your life must be off limits to God. There's this profound statement in Romans 12 about transformation. You've probably heard it before, where Paul says that he is pleading with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let your life be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And then Paul continues in verse 2. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by what? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So first of all, Paul's call for us is to give our bodies to God. Okay, give my body to God. How? By being a living sacrifice. What does that mean? This is a language of, the, of worship in the Old Testament. That's what Paul's referring to. In, in coming to God in the Old Testament, a worshiper would bring a sheep or a bull or a pigeon and it would sacrifice it on the altar as an offering to God. There were different kinds of sacrifices, but at the heart of that sacrifice was the fact that sin demanded punishment and the slain animal represented God's willingness to accept a substitute so that the worshiper might live and have an ongoing relationship of forgiveness and joy with God. So each time a worshiper would come to an altar with their animal, that was their version of saying, I am choosing to believe that God's forgiveness is enough. 
And over and over, the worshiper would have to come through and do this over and over again. Paul's point here is not to present just your bodies and not your mind or your heart or your spirit. What Paul is referring to as your body, as a living sacrifice, is your lifestyle. The way that you live that life. Presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. Because it is your living that is the act of worship. So think about that for a moment. If my living, if my existence, if who I am is supposed to be my act of worship to God, you're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, I have a lot of places in my life I need to change. Because that version of my existence is not honoring God, is not worshiping God. So let every act of your body in living be an act of worship. That is, you let every aspect of your life be a demonstration of, that God is your treasure. And that's the question you have, you have to ask yourself in your reflection, is God my treasure? Let every act of your living body show that Christ is more precious to you than anything else. Let every act of your living body be a death to all things that dishonor the Lord. And so we're not just presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, we are presenting our marriage our families, our finances, our education, our belief system as a living sacrifice. How does that come into terms practically? Well, we do this by not allowing the worries of the world to distract us. That's how people in the world have their pattern of living. Their pattern is worry about everything and hope it all works out in the end. The pattern of worldliness is by not or the pattern of worldliness is by allowing other substances to control us. We can offer ourselves as a living sacrifice by not allowing the TV to control dinner time. We do this by not allowing youth sports to determine our church attendance. John Piper says, quote, This body has been given to us to make the beauty of Christ visible to others. So in that vein, think about that for a moment. If your life, your lifestyle, your choices, your decisions, your habits, your formation, all these things, if it is supposed to be a visible representation of the beauty of Christ, how are you making God beautiful to others? I'm going to let you sit with that one for a moment. Because it is so important for us to understand that every aspect of my being must be that I am making God beautiful to other people. But we don't always do that, do we? And maybe some of you feel stuck in that right now. I know I need to give my life to Jesus. I know I need to seek transformation, but I just feel trapped. Maybe it's emotional pain. Maybe it's just that you're content with your walk with Christ. Why do more when I've been doing it for X amount of years? Maybe it's an addiction, maybe drugs, alcohol, porn, your phone. Maybe it's a pattern of relationships. It's not that we don't want to change. It's not that we aren't trying to change, but most of us don't know how to change. Think about this. Every morning when you wake up, that first decision you make sets the pace for the rest of your day. We are being formed by the stories we believe from our habits our relationships, and even by our environment. There's an old saying, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Now the whole point to that is that we are moldable, we are shaped, and we are formed by things and people we spend most time around. So do me a favor, after you leave church today, I want you to just take inventory of one day. One day of your week and think about what do you do in that day, let's call it Monday, Maybe you're going back to school. Maybe you're going back to work. You've taken a longer vacation time. You're going back to work, and now you're thinking, okay, 6 a.m., I'm awake. 6.15, coffee's not made yet. Okay, 6.30, coffee's made. I'm drinking two or three cups before I leave for work. 7 o'clock, you're leaving for work. 7.30, you're getting there. 7.45. 8 o'clock, you start work. 8.30, you take a break. 8.45, you joke around with some coworkers or some friends. 9 o'clock, you're back to work. By noon, you're eating lunch. 
By three, you're taking another break. By four o'clock, you're clocking out. You get home by five. You get home, you watch TV because the whole day was just too much already. You can't really handle it, so you need to decompress a little bit, right? And five o'clock comes around. If it's Monday, Monday night football's on. So 5.15, 5.30, you're getting ready for the game. You have about three hours of a window that no one else can touch you because the game is on. It's playoff time. Things are happening. It's moving fast. Six o'clock, you're eating dinner, and you keep the TV on because it's playoffs. And so therefore, we have to skip devotion for today, but we'll do it tomorrow, right? That's the famous last words. And then your kids are running around. You're telling them to go take a shower because they need to get ready because they need to go to bed early because they start school the next day. And then you find yourself exhausted by 8.15 because your team lost and they missed the playoffs and all these things are happening. And then by 9 o'clock, you're tired. You're getting ready for bed. And by 9.30, you're in bed and you're watching Netflix. You're binging until about 11.30 or midnight. You're like, oh my gosh, just one more episode. And then by 1 a.m., you're like, oh shoot, I gotta get up in four hours. Have I stressed you out yet? Are you exhausted? That's not even 24 hours. That's about 18 hours of a day and that's just one day out of seven days out of a week. Look at what formation can do. Look at what habits can do when you don't give time to God and you think that Sundays are enough. It's not going to happen. I don't know how many times I could say this over and over again, but Sunday mornings alone is not enough. Even Sundays in a small group is not enough. Even Sundays in small group and men's group or men's breakfast or women's brunch, I don't know why men don't call it brunch. I like brunch. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with that. Maybe we'll start calling it men's brunch. Anyway, the whole point is that even all these things that we would open up as opportunities for you to do what we might call godly things in life, it's not enough if you are not doing it yourself. If you cannot instigate, if you cannot start that rhythm or formation, no one else can do it for you. And so you're not going to drift into desiring more time with God. You have to be intentional about it. I would even go so far to say that following Jesus is more of a counterformation than anything else. You see, we, we naturally tend to distance ourselves from God. If the psalmist, David, says that if I was born into sin, that my natural person is someone who doesn't always desire God. There are times when I don't desire to go to church, and I have to, because it's my job, it's what I do. I have to unlock the building. I gotta preach. And there are times, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't want to. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. But the habit, the formation, the rhythm of doing something like that over and over again will, will show proof that you are desiring more of God than the natural person. So yes, we don't often wake up thinking, I want to be more like Jesus today. Yes, because as soon as you get on the road and that person cuts you off and they're not doing the whole yielding thing, you know what I'm talking about over Cherry Valley? People getting as far as they can until they have to yield and then they're honking at me like, I didn't do this. That's not my fault. You're the one who needs to go back to school. Traffic school, that is. We tend to wake up thinking, how can I add more hours to my day? I want to be someone more like you fill in the blank. The reason following Jesus is sort of a counterformation, as John Mark Comer puts it, is because it has to offset all other habits that are forming you. It's what has been widely known as purposeful spiritual formation rather than aimless spiritual formation. You think that you getting closer to God is just going to happen on its own? No, you have to be intentional about that. So rather, what we need to do is we need to replace the news with teaching. We need to replace habits with practices. We need to replace relationships with community. And we need to replace our environment with the Holy Spirit. And Paul's vision for us becoming this living sacrifice is through transformation of our mind. 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach God? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So exactly how powerful is my mind? 
how powerful are your thoughts? Often people in, in scientific terms believe that we only tap into a small percentage of our brain. Regardless of that statistic, the reality is that when you have one thought about something, you're likely to have that same thought again in your life. Here's the power of thought. What are you going to do for lunch today? In and out, you're going to be like, oh, hey, that sounds pretty good, actually. I think I might go to in and out and I'm going to get a text from about five or six of you, Pastor Brad, we went to In-N-Out. Because I mentioned lunch, which is already on our mind. It's what time? I don't, it's 11.15. We're thinking about lunch, let's be honest. And In-N-Out, it sounds kind of good. It, it sounds nice. A warm burger on a cold day, like, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? And the fact that I'm still talking about it, your thought process is like, I know exactly what I'm going to get. And I know exactly which one to go to that doesn't have a longer line than the other one. See, your thought process is so powerful that just the simple thought of what you're going to do for lunch is already forming the rest of your day. Do you see that? And when we think that thought, our brain receives this signal and that it wants something and you release this chemical in your brain that says, yes, please. And when that signal reaches your brain again and again and again and again, it begins to crave it and want it and need it. Or... Your thought process can be so powerful that even the thought of in and out you're like, that's disgusting. I don't want anything to do with it. I would rather have sushi. And now you're like, oh, yeah, sushi would sound, yeah. Or maybe soup or something like that. You, do you see what's happening? But see, this, this signal reaching your brain is not just about relationships or social media or even the effects of porn. Although it is that, your thought process can be so powerful and positive. It can be positive in the sense that when you remember the particular ingredients to a dish without needing the recipe. Now, I think most women in here can probably do that really well. I'm a recipe guy. Like, I follow by the book. If it says, it, if the picture it shows is what it looks like, and it's giving me the recipe for it to look like that, I'm going to follow every single direction. But you know that there's one particular meal that's been passed down from generation to generation And you ask what the recipe is, and they say, I don't know. It's just, I watched my mom do it. I watched my grandma do it. And they made this dish, and they added something, and it sounds weird, but it works. You see, it's because the thought, and because you've given yourself over to that thing, the more that thought enters our mind, the more of it we become and we know. There's an analogy that's used about hiking in the jungle with a machete. Now, bear with me. It's going to work, I promise. The trail in the jungle is your life. So you're walking the path. You're walking down this trail in the jungle. The jungle is your brain, okay? There's branches everywhere, and this machete that you have as you're hacking away are all the thoughts that you are using on this trail. So the moment you think about that one thing, we'll use in and out again because we're reinforcing positive things in life, We're thinking that, so we're going to hack away with that thought, like, I'm going to In-N-Out. I know how to get there. And you keep hacking away at that thought, at that thought, at that thought. And the more you hack away at that trail, the more aware you are of how to get there quicker the next time, right? You don't even need me to talk about lunch. You're already like, you should crave In-N-Out every day. What's wrong with you? That's the whole point. You see, you're already hacking your way through your brain telling you, I know how to get there quicker, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to formations, when it comes to binge watching or scrolling on social media, you don't have to think twice about it. Have you ever opened your phone and like, what, how, how did I get on the app? You didn't have to purposefully like, where did I put Instagram again? No, your, your brain, as soon as you pull your phone out of your pocket, you're already scrolling, you're already swiping, you find the app and you're already like, 10 minutes later, you're like, what have I been doing with my life? Nothing. Because you know, because you've hacked away at that formation over and over again, you know how to get there quicker. You can navigate that thought without even thinking about it. You know exactly where to go. It's that same phenomenon maybe some of you have experienced when you're driving the same route every day for work or school or the grocery store, and you don't even know how you got there. Or you don't even know how you got home. Did I stop at that stoplight back there? Did I yield like the thing that I tell everyone else to do? Am I doing that too? There are things in our minds, these patterns are what make up our everyday life. I know my wife's name. I know my kids' names 
most of the time. I, I swore when I had kids that I would always know their name and, and what it was, and I always called the other one the other name. I'm not sure why. It just happens. I know my phone number. I don't know anyone else's because why remember anyone's phone number anymore? But if we give ourselves over to these particular formations, they become second nature. They become memory. They become what just happens to shape us. And even if they're toxic or destructive behaviors, we'll act on those impulses like second nature. But there is hope. I hope you know that this morning, that you can rewire your thought process, but it does not happen with the flip of a switch. Three steps to building a firm foundation. Well, clearly, Jesus says in verse 24, if everyone then who hears these words of mine, this was on the tail end of his Sermon on the Mount, known as the greatest sermon ever given. And he's saying, if you hear the things that I had to say in the Sermon on the Mount, and if you hear them and you do them, your foundation, it's going to be unshakable. The rain can come, the floods can blast through the foundation, and it will not move. But there's also a countermeasure, that the person who hears Jesus and does not do them, well, they're just building their house on sand. They're building sand castles for fun. They're okay with storms of life, knocking it down. Oh, i got to build back up again. Three steps to help you build a firm foundation. Number one, rethink. There's a transformation process, clearly, Romans 12 tells us, can take place if we're willing to think different in the terms of Apple. Rethink. Think differently about your formation. I know that so often what seems to be this this subject matter of talking about a holier than thou, people are like, I don't listen to secular music. I don't watch YouTube. I don't watch this show. We don't have Netflix. We don't even have a TV. We don't even own any of those things. We don't have any subscriptions to anything. We don't have music. We listen to ourselves sing worship songs. And people are like, you sound boring. You sound so holy that you are a version of something that no one else can attain to. And you're thinking, well, is that such a bad thing? Is the formation of my mind willing and able to think differently than everyone else? And my fear is that for the last 50 to 60 years, the church has wanted to become something that allows people from the world into the church to let them see that we're not just all that different. Friends, family, we are different people. We are weird. We are religious people who do weird religious things. And for the sake of Christ, we should not apologize about that. So if God is calling you away from secular music, if he's calling you away from particular things, maybe that's the Holy Spirit initiating something in you that you couldn't recognize for yourself. Consider what that looks like. And if someone says, wow, you're you're a really holy person, deep down inside you know the sin that you still struggle with. Welcome to life. Welcome to humanity. Home of the sinner. Glad you could join us. Rethink you through your transformation process, what that can look like. And then number two, the rethinking leads to retraining. You can't just rethink a thought and hopefully that it just kind of like happens. You have to retrain yourself into that as well. And thirdly, keep doing that. Repeat. Rethink, retrain, repeat. You see, patterns are important. The more consistent you are, the more important it will become. The rewiring takes time. To build a firm foundation, you need to learn how to retrain your mind to be teachable. What are some of the ways that you can rethink? Well, number one, read your Bible. Gosh, dang it. Read your Bible. But I just, I, read your Bible. Start there. Well, where in the Bible? Start in the Gospel of John. It's an easy book to read. And guess what? If you have questions, there are other people in here who've read it before. And you can ask them. And they'll tell you what it means. Number two, read good books. Be a reader. There's a reason that that the Bible is a book that we've been given that allows us to see who Jesus is because most of us don't like to read. So if you need an audio Bible or if you need audio books or whatever the case may be, get into that, but read good books. If you need recommendations, let me know. I'll more than 
I'll be more than willing to let you borrow some books or if you want to build your own library, do that your way, whatever you want to do. Number two, or number three, sit under pastoral teaching. Now, let, me, let me be clear about what I mean by that. What I mean by that is stop jumping around to churches where there's a guest speaker and you're like, I love that guy so much. Oh my gosh, he speaks truth into my life. Congratulations, that's great. Cool, praise God. But that's not going to form you into a follower of Jesus by just listening to some motivational speech or some celebrity pastor that has your attention. Sit under godly teaching of God's word Sunday after Sunday. And if you're like, well, I don't know if I can actually do that here. I know plenty of churches in the area where you can do that. So it doesn't have to be here. We would love for you to be here. We love you and we want you to be here. But if you're like, ah, I just, I need different teaching. Ask. There are different churches in the area that we know and love, that we partner with, that we would love for you to be a part of if that is how you feel. But we would rather you be here, by the way. Number four, whether it's podcasting, YouTube, or whatever, it doesn't have to be some over-the-top sermon, but faithful leading of God's word. And then number five, how, how, can, how else can you rethink? Talk to someone about it. You're like, that's the hardest part. I know. It is the hardest part. Did you know that most people say when you read a book or when you listen to a podcast, if you are able to discuss it with someone else, you're actually more inclined to remember it than you are if you just listen to it yourself or even write notes about it? So you listen to a sermon, you're like, hey, I need to share this with you. You need to listen to it because we need to talk about this. You're like, all right, let's do it. And here are three excuses that keep us from doing those five things. Number one, I don't like to read. I don't care. Start reading. Number two, I can't multitask with a podcast. Same. So I do it when I'm driving. Number three, I don't like to listen to sermons. Well, you need to grow up because that's what God has called us to do. To, as Acts 2 says, listen to the apostles' teaching and doctrine, breaking of bread, fellowship with one another. And if you can't do any of those three things, get into community. That's why we're restructuring our small groups and things like that. I'm going on. I need to end because um, we're wrapping up here soon. I have six minutes. Oh, never mind. I'm good. And maybe some of you are doing that. And that's great. You're going to church. You're doing family devotions. You take notes from the sermon. But then you stall out. How many of you ever stalled out before? That, that's a, a phrase from uh, being able to drive a manual transmission. Anyone do that? I love driving manual. I wish that cars were still made that way. I haven't seen any in a, in a while. My first car was stick shift, and I had to learn how to do it myself, and it was awesome. And I stalled out on hills, and I'm like, I'm going to die. And I didn't, but I figured it out, and I loved it because it was like, you know, as, as a, a young boy growing up, you're like, you're making the noises of the shift change, and then to do it in real life, game changer. It's, it's revolutionary. Let's get back to it. Maybe you've stalled out. And you think, man, I know what I need to do. I know what I need to do. Well, knowing it and doing it are two very different things. You can't think your way to Christ-likeness. Your problem isn't knowledge. You know what you need to know. Your problem is that information transfer alone is not enough for transformation because knowing something is not the same as doing it. We have this gap between what we know and what we do. One of the books that I would recommend to you, I've recommended before, I've quoted before, uh, by the author James K.A. Smith. His book is called You Are What You Love. Basic foundation of what I'm preaching to you today from Matthew 7 and from everything else is based on his book. You Are What You Love. He tells this story about his wife who gives him this book about healthy eating some sort of like whole foods, organic, backed by science type of eating lifestyle habit. And he's loving the book. He's eating it up. And as he's reading the book, he realizes something about his situation as he's reading it. He looks up from the book and is reminded that he is sitting in the Costco food court shoving a hot dog into his mouth. Now see, so often that can be our situation. We're reading a book and we're like, this is so good. 
This book is revolutionary. You're highlighting, you're underlining, you're sharing it, you're quoting it on your Twitter or X is whatever it's called on Instagram, all the things. And everyone knows about it because you're letting them know. And then you're sitting at home and you're like, I am doing the exact opposite of what this book is telling me to do. The problem is not knowledge. Listen, you ready? It's love. James Smith loves hot dogs. Apparently the Costco ones are pretty good. I haven't had one in a while, but I hear they're good. And I hear they're like $2, so like, hello, like balling on a budget, right? And so he is framing this idea around not knowledge being the issue, but love being the issue. The reason we have a hard time getting up in the morning, going to the gym, is because we love sleep. Can I get an amen? I want, I, that was not, that was like two amens in the corner, like, good, like, whatever, repent and believe God, kingdom of God is at hand. The reason it's been hard to eat healthier is because you love carbs. You love candy. You love bread. You love chocolate. The reason you can't drink black coffee is because you're not even drinking coffee normally. You're putting caramel and sugar and cream and all these other weird substances into it. Repent. Believe in the Lord. Drink black coffee. And you know what else? You still love your sin. You love your sin. You love scrolling until until your thumb starts cramping. You still love looking for images you shouldn't. You still love the anger because it makes you feel so powerful. You still love slander because you want the promotion so bad. What we love in our heart has a far greater influence on what we do, and that is why Matthew 7 is where we were today. Because Jesus says, hear what I'm saying and do something about it. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. John 13 says, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. James 1 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, what? Deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving anyone else. You're deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, who perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Friends, this is the starting point. This is the concrete being poured. This is the rock we are building our life on. What we do, we become. Our daily habits, our weekly habits. And so the question you have to honestly ask yourself with intent on doing something about is this. What do I love? If you haven't heard anything this entire time, the question is what do I love? Because how you answer that will define you. And we have to ask this because we love so many of the wrong things. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And so for the next few weeks or so, we're going to keep going through this idea of having a starting point and getting to the finish line. I believe that what you need to look at within what you need to look at within can be summed up in three words. And these are going to take shape for the next few weeks in our series together. We have a starting point, And now as we're looking to, towards the finish line, we need to seek, we need to steward, and we need to serve. And those three formations, those three habits, if you will, are going to shape everything else you would want for the rest of your year. So for the non-believer in this room, this is a call to love Jesus. Now, here's my challenge to you. I know most of you in the room, and I know most of you are believers. 
The question is, where are the unbelievers? Just think about that. For the believer in this room, this is a call into deeper intimacy with Jesus. And that's why we're formulating this right here, right now, because there is a next step for each and every one of you to take. You need to figure out what it is. I'm not going to tell you. If you need help and, and wisdom, I'll help you get there, but you need to figure out what that next step is for your life. Whether that next step is actually following Jesus and giving your life to him, whether you've had something off limits to him and now you're like, I need to break open that barrier and I need to give that to Christ. Whatever your next step is, each and every one of us have a next step. And I don't, I don't want you to think that this is easy for me to talk about because it's my job or because I've, I've perfectly formulated this. No, I'm still learning. Ask Lindsay. Just ask her, like, is Brad doing great with his habits? She'll be like, no, he's not. He actually needs a lot more work than you think. Praise God, because I have you to pray for me in that, and you have me to pray for you. So as we come to the communion table this morning, we're going to be mindful of what our next step is and asking ourselves the question, what do I love? Whether good, whether bad, whether sinful, or whether holy, ask yourself that question this morning, and better yet, ask someone else what they think your love is. You might get a more honest response. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts to partake of communion this morning.